today on the Emmanuel Pulpit. And today we see that the life that comes through repentant, believing faith in Christ is not a common, average, ordinary, run-of-the-mill, fit in with the culture, go along to get along, mingle with everybody else kind of life. No, the resurrection of Jesus Christ should have a very practical, personal, ongoing impact on our life. And so today from John 20, beginning in verse 11, I want to speak about the resurrected life. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. Paul, the apostle, said that he wanted to know Christ and the power of His resurrection. What does it mean to know the power of the resurrection of Jesus? Well, I think that phrase means a lot beyond the scope and ability of this single message. But we find in John chapter 20 a few examples of how the power of the resurrection impacted them and how it should therefore impact us. One of my favorite stories to tell is borrowed from the teaching ministry of Dr. John MacArthur, whom you may hear on the radio or on the internet with the program Grace to You. MacArthur tells of a man trying to convince him that every morning while he shaves, Jesus comes into the man's bathroom and talks to him and fellowships with him. MacArthur asks the man, what do you do when Jesus appears while you're shaving? And the man commented that he talks to Jesus while he finishes shaving. And MacArthur rightly notes, you've not seen the Lord. Because when you've seen the risen Christ... You can't keep doing the same things after you see Him that you were doing before you saw Him. That is true of a man shaving with a supposed epiphany of the Lord Jesus. It is also true for you and for me. And so I ask you this Lord's Day, have you seen Him? Not with physical eyes. Have you seen Him with the eyes of your heart? Have you seen Him with the eyes of the Spirit? If you have, I promise you there will be a change. There will be a transforming, powerful effect of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And today we find three simple examples of how our lives should be affected. First of all, I want you to notice that the resurrected life is a grateful life. In verses 11 through 18, we see a demonstration of thanksgiving and gratitude from the heart, the mouth, the life of this woman by the name of Mary Magdalene. She shows us the resurrected life is a grateful life. Now, you've heard me say before, I believe that pride is the mother of all sin. And if pride is the mother of all sin, ingratitude is one of her oldest children. There are many ways in which we can express gratitude to our God. We can do it through the singing of a song. We've done that in this service. We can do it through the praying of a prayer. We've done that in this service. I hope you do it in your private life. We can do it through the proclamation of a sermon. By God's grace, it's what I'm doing right now. But Mary Magdalene shows her gratitude to God, not with a song that she sang or a prayer that she prayed, but with the life that she lived. Stated more simply, her response to the resurrection of Jesus Evidence that she had not gotten over the fact that she had not always had a resurrected life. There was a time before she encountered the Lord Jesus that she was dead as a hammer, lost in her trespasses and her sins. We learn from the scriptures that she was possessed by seven demons and yet she encountered the Lord Jesus Christ and she was set free from that old sin-sick, hell-bound life and her heart was filled with thanksgiving and with gratitude. The resurrected life is manifested as a grateful life. Now as we look at Mary's response to the risen Lord, consider with me first of all the memory of her sin. The Bible tells us about a number of women named Mary. When today's text begins in verse 11, we simply know her as Mary. Down in verse 18, John clarifies we're we're speaking not about Mary the mother of Jesus, not one of the other Marys, but verse 18 says we're talking about Mary Magdalene. Who was this woman named Mary Magdalene? Well, we first meet her in Luke's gospel, chapter 8. Verses 2 and 3 says that Mary, who was called Magdalene. 
Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, she and many others were contributing to Jesus' support out of their private means. When we meet Mary Magdalene, we see that her life has been transformed by the ministry and the message of Jesus Christ. And because of that, she begins to do what Christians are still doing today. She gives of her own financial means to support the ongoing ministry of Christ. I hope you did that just a few moments ago or in another service sometime this month, depending on the schedule of your giving. Mary was a giver because Mary had been given life. Twice in this text, she announces that she does not know something. She says she does not know where the body of Jesus is. She believes they have taken him away, and she does not know where they have laid him. But Mary is not moved by what she does not know. Mary is still motivated by what she does know. I am convinced that she is committed to a final encounter with the physical body of Jesus Because she has not yet gotten over the first encounter that she had with the Lord. We learn in Luke that she had these seven demons cast out of her. Mark 16, 9 tells us very clearly Jesus is the one who performed that exorcism. Mary had been controlled by demons and Jesus set her free. Now in the Middle Ages, a a, a common folklore emerged about Mary Magdalene. It's not found in the Bible. But many consider Mary Magdalene to have been a harlot or a prostitute. That's really conjecture. But what we do know is this. Before she met the Lord Jesus, she was what one writer calls a welcome spot for the minions of hell. In other words, before Christ, her life was the kind of life that made demons feel at home. Before she met Jesus, the home of her heart was a haunted house. Many Bible scholars have noted that the number seven, Mary Magdalene had seven demons. They note that the number seven denotes completion, fullness, or totality. And they say that these seven demons might represent her life was completely, totally controlled by demonic spirits. Now we cannot be dogmatic about that, but how many of you know if your life is controlled by even one demon, you're in really bad shape and you need the help of the Lord Jesus Christ. Earlier in her life, she had the kind of lifestyle that was characterized by the devil himself. I don't know how it happened or when it happened, but I do know this based on the scripture. Years earlier, her life had been wrecked and ravaged by sin. But she met a carpenter from Nazareth who exercised those demons and his power over the demonic world set her free. I do not know what she might have been saying or singing. I know this song had not yet been written, but I just wonder in my mind if she went around singing, I'd been shackled by a heavy burden neath a load of guilt and shame, but then the hand of Jesus touched me and now I am no longer the same. Her heart was filled with gratitude for the Lord Jesus Christ. And now her grief is intense because she believes the body of the Master to be gone. Tell me where they have laid him. And I will perform one last act of thanksgiving to my Lord. We see in this grateful life the memory of her sin. But as we just talk about Mary for a moment, I want you to note also the mercy in her selection. Mary Magdalene is what we call her. She was from the town of Magdala. She is mentioned a dozen times in the Bible, more than most of the apostles. Mary Magdalene is one of only a handful of people who were witness to both the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. Do you not find it a statement of mercy that this woman, whose sins had been so many, whose life had been so stained with transgressions and trespasses to God, she becomes the very first eyewitness to the resurrected Christ. She becomes the first ear witness. 
And in a moment, she becomes the first mouth witness to the glorious news that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. I find it worth noting that honor did not go to Caiaphas or to Annas. It wasn't given to Gamaliel. It wasn't even given to Peter or James or John. In our modern vernacular, Jesus did not first appear to a young lady who grew up in church who wore the frills and the bows and the ribbons around the hem of the dress, whose chest was was laden down with a banner filled with perfect attendance Sunday school pins. No, Jesus first appeared in our language today to a woman who knew what it was like to wake up with the smell of cheap liquor and Marlboro's on her breath. A woman in our day whose hands and arms might be popped with needles who might know what it's like to wake up in an inebriated state, to go in and out of all types of rehab. Jesus appeared to a woman to demonstrate he, the Son of Man, had indeed come to seek and to save that which was lost. And there's mercy in that selection. It tells me there might just be hope for you and there might just be hope for me. Jesus always did His work in unsuspecting ways through unlikely people. Back in the Old Testament when God wanted to free Israel from the bondage of Egypt, from the hand of the most powerful man in the world, what did he do? He raised up a stuttering, murderous prophet. When he wanted to preach revival to the sin-sick city of Nineveh, what did he do? He sent a backslidden, apathetic Hard-hearted prophet with seaweed in his hair and the smell of fish guts on his clothes. When our great God wanted to kill a giant, he didn't send an army. He sent a little teenage shepherd boy with a sling in his hand and a bag full of rocks. And when it came time to save the world, oh, don't go look in the baby beds of the palaces of royalty. Go down behind the inn in the little village of Bethlehem. And there amid the sights and the sounds and the smell of a ranked, stinking cattle stall, you will hear the hushed cries of a virgin mother and the cry of a baby. And when you hear that cry, do not turn away. That is your God who has come to save you. There is mercy in her selection. I'm saying we ought to rise up and say, God, if you can declare your glory through a floating axe head, if you can speak your word through a dumb donkey, God, if you can multiply fish and bread, then God, you can use me. And I beg you in light of the resurrection, use me for your glory. There's the memory of her sin. The mercy in her selection. Then lastly, note the the message in her story. Verses 17 and 18. She has obviously grabbed hold of the Lord Jesus. Now your text may say, don't touch me. The verb tense here literally means stop touching me. Mary, can you see her as she has just latched on to the risen body of Jesus? Mary, let me go. Mary... You don't have to hold on to me like that. Mary, there's a new relationship. Mary, I'm never going to leave you again. Even when I send back to the Father, Mary, I will still be with you. And she goes and tells these men in verse 18, I have seen the Lord and that He had said these things to her. Follow in your mind what was going on in Mary's life at this moment in human history. John 19, 25 tells us Mary Magdalene was there on that blood-stained hill called Calvary. She had heard the cries of mockery. She had witnessed the blood from His thorn-pierced brow. She saw them drive nails into His hands and into His feet. She heard the insults and the mockery and the scoffing. But she had also heard her Lord cry out, Today you will be with me in paradise. She had heard Him say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. She had heard Him say, It is finished. She had heard Him breathe His last and cry out, Father, into Your hands I commit my spirit. 
Mary had been there that day when the sky grew dark and the earth began to shake. She was there that day when the veil in the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. But now by that grave, the body of Jesus gone, none of that mattered because in her mind, Jesus was still dead. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, that if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless You are still in your sin. Perhaps Mary does not realize the full theological weight of this, but she does understand this when she goes with the message of the resurrection. Christ has been raised from the dead. And that means the Father has accepted the payment of Jesus on the cross for my sin. John MacArthur puts it this way, commenting on this text. He says, when God raised Jesus from the dead... He was declaring that he was satisfied by Jesus' perfect sacrifice and had accepted it as full payment for the sins of his people. Friend, why should our heart be filled with gratitude and thanksgiving because of the resurrection? It is because without the resurrection of Jesus, one day I will stand before God and give an account for every wicked word Every evil thought, every sinful action, and if Jesus is not raised from the dead, I will stand there by myself with no help, no mediator, no go-between, no advocate, nobody to plead my case. But when Jesus rose from the dead, I think this is what is filling Mary's heart. I have an advocate with the Father who will reconcile me to God. I stand redeemed by the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, that's the impact the resurrection should have. Are you listening? We should live a grateful life to God. But The resurrected life was not only a grateful life. The resurrected life is also a peaceful life. In verses 19 and 20, Jesus gives his first resurrected words to his apostles. Peace be with you. Now up until this point of the narrative, the disciples have been filled with anything but peace. And their peace was because of fear. The lack of peace was because of fear. I want you to notice three things about this peaceful life. First, what I have entitled the barrier to peace. I want you to notice that word is in the singular. Not multiplied manifold barriers, only one. Now, if you look in verse 19, you'll think that fear was the barrier to peace. You might even think that these doors through which Jesus just miraculously moved might have been a barrier. The text says they were hiding out because of fear of the Jews. The fear of the Jews is a common thread in John's gospel. You remember the man born blind back in John chapter 9? His parents did not want to testify about what Christ had done for their son because of the fear of the Jews. They thought they'd be cast out of the temple. The Bible says that Joseph of Arimathea was a secret follower of Jesus because of the fear of the Jews. And here we find... The disciples are afraid of the Jews. But I don't think fear is the barrier. I believe the barrier to peace, are you listening, is ignorance. Christ has been resurrected from the dead all day long. It's now evening. You mean to tell me they would have been afraid of the Jews if they knew that their Savior had just conquered death? When you and I do not have peace in our lives, it's because of something we either don't know or we do know, but we have momentarily forgotten. Let me illustrate that. If some wealthy benefactor had put a million dollars in your bank account, the only reason you'd be worried about the bank coming to repo your car is if you don't know what you've got in the bank. Ignorance led to anxiety. Did you follow what I just said? Someone said what you don't know won't hurt you. Well, that may or may not be true, but what you don't know can rob you of your peace. 
Had they known that their Savior was raised from the dead, there would have been no need for this fear of the Jews. I heard about a preacher who asked one of his deacons, said, do you know what our church's biggest problems are? And the deacon said, frankly, I don't know and I don't care. And the pastor said, right. Indifference and ignorance. Don't know and don't care. Meanwhile, Daniel 11.32 says that the people who know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. In a different context, Hosea 4.6 declares, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. This means that your lack of peace, peace with God, peace with others, your lack of peace is a matter of ignorance. It is a matter of something that you do not know. This is one of several reasons why you ought to be in Sunday school. This is one of several reasons why you've done well to be under the preaching of God's Word this morning. This is why you would do well to set aside all of those cockamamie excuses and be back tonight for the closing session of our fall revival series. Brother Barry Snap, one of the greatest preachers in the state of Georgia, you want to be here for the 6 o'clock service. This is one reason why you need to gather together with your family to study God's Word and to pray and to grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ because life has a way of slamming you against the wall and throwing you against the rope. And in that moment of crisis, in the crucible of difficulty, you will have worry and fear and anxiety if you do not know who your God is and what your God has done for you. There's the barrier to peace. Notice also in verse 19 the blessing of peace. Jesus comes and the first word out of his resurrected mouth to these men is the word peace. Peace be with you. He repeats it in verse 21. Peace be with you. They were Baptist apostles. He knew they had to hear it at least twice. Psalm 29 11 says the Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. We've all heard the story about the man who saved up his money to go on a cruise to the Bahamas. And he had scrimped and saved every last penny to buy those tickets and didn't think he had any money to buy food on that cruise ship. So he snuck some cheese crackers and bottled water in his luggage. And on the last day of the trip, someone saw him eating this little meager meal, and they said, man, why are you doing that? Man, these, these are buffets to die for. He said, I, I used all my money to buy the ticket. I don't have any money to eat in these fancy restaurants. And they said, don't you realize that was included in the price of the ticket? Now, friend, listen to me. Peace from God, the peace of God, and peace with God was all included in the price tag of your salvation. Galatians 5, beginning in verse 22, lays out for us the fruit of the Spirit and says, among other things, the fruit of the Spirit is peace. That means that if my life is not marked by peace, if I, like many of you, are filled with worry and stress and anxiety, if my life is not filled with peace, What I really need to do is tap into what I already own, appropriate what I already possess, and live like who I already am. Peace has been provided through Christ Jesus. A a fretful Christian ought to be a contradiction of terms. There's the blessing of peace, the barrier to peace. And lastly, we notice the basis for peace. Verse 20, and when he had said this, He showed them both his hands and his side, and then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Now this demonstration of his wounds is an indicator that the kind of peace Jesus is talking about is not merely, are you listening? It's not merely emotional peace, although it includes that. It's not merely relational peace, although I believe it includes that. But its primary focus is spiritual peace peace. Jesus says, peace be with you. And again, peace be with you. And to show you that I can provide peace, look at my hands. Look at my side. 
I have purchased for you peace with God. That is why I have put in my notes that peace, real spiritual peace, is based on the power and the person and the presence of Jesus Christ. Real peace is based on the presence of Jesus. Real peace is not an emotion. An emotion is based on circumstances. And it will go up and down and in and out and off and on. But real peace is not based on a circumstance. Real peace is based on the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, When I was growing up, my dad, uh, who had been raised on a farm, always wanted to have a garden. And he even wanted to have some farm animals. Now, I was not raised on a farm I was raised in a little subdivision. Don't you know the neighbors loved the fact that we had chickens, a horse, and hogs? Not pigs. Pigs are for sissies. We had hogs. And because we had three types of animals, and I'm one of three children, we would rotate the the feeding and the care duties for the day. If you fed the horse yesterday, today was your day to feed the chickens, and tomorrow would be your day to slop the hogs. So how many of you know slop the hogs? Well, the job that I hated the most was feeding the chickens. And it really wasn't the chickens that were the problem, it was this rooster. His name was Legion. He was demon-possessed. And I don't know how well roosters smell, but I'll tell you this. He smelled fear in the heart of a little boy who was supposed to go take the chicken feed and the water out to the chicken coop. And he would get on me like white on rice. But there was one one way that I was not afraid to go into that chicken coop. That's when my daddy was with me. You see, when daddy would walk in the chicken coop, he'd just stomp his foot like that. And that old rooster would go squawking off into the corner, and I'd go, yeah. That rooster thinks he's something, doesn't he? I'm not afraid of you. I was not afraid of something I would normally be afraid of because of the presence of someone that I knew could handle the thing that brought me fear. Here's the basis for peace. Your great risen Lord is with you. So you can have peace at the hospital because Jehovah Rapha is with you, the God who heals. You can have peace at the lawyer's office because your eternal advocate is with you. You can have peace when you're visiting a family member at the hospice house or the funeral home because the one who is with you and inside you is himself the resurrection and the life. When we experience the power of the resurrection, we will live a grateful life. We will live a peaceful life. Lastly, the resurrected life is a meaningful life. Many of you will remember the story that Brother Frank Cox, who pastors in North Georgia and has preached in this church, He tells the story of being called by the funeral home to go preach a funeral for someone he did not know. It's kind of a cold call. They were unconnected to a church, and he didn't know them, they didn't know him, but he shows up at the funeral home to preach this service. Meeting with the family a few moments before the service to find out a little information so he could try to personalize the service as much as possible, he said, tell me about your mother. One person said, Mama loved race cars. Yeah. Personally, I don't understand that. I mean, just... <laughs> different strokes for different folks. But anyway, he said, that's great. Your mother loved NASCAR. Your mama loved race cars. What else? That's it. Mama loved race cars. Can we not agree that NASCAR fan or not would be a pretty sad epitaph, wouldn't it? That the people who know you best, that's all they can say? Daddy loved the Bulldogs? 
Mama loved the gators. Well, he loved the railroad. Daddy loved to hunt. Nothing wrong with any of those things in their proper perspective. But the resurrected life is going to be lived for a whole lot more than temporal, passing pleasures of this world. Now that meaningful life is characterized in three ways, and I'll share them very quickly as we close. Notice, first of all, there is the scriptural mandate. In verse 21, John gives us his rendering of what we call the Great Commission. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Jesus says, in light of my resurrection, I'm sending you out on a mission. Here is the purpose of your life. You know, a lot of people go around every day, day in, day out, sun up to sundown, searching for their purpose in life. But for a child of God, that would not be necessary. We find our purpose right here in these words. Our purpose has been mandated in God's holy word. So I ask you today, if your life's purpose is to be, listen now, that as the Father has sent the Son, the Son is now sending you and sending me. If that is your life's purpose, then I want to ask you a question. What is going on in your life or what is not going on in your life that either its presence or its absence could only be explained by saying, The reason I'm doing that is because as the Father sent the Son, the Son has now sent me. Or the reason I'm not doing that, there's only one reason. As the Father sent the Son, the Son is now sending me. I mean, why do you give so much to the cause of Christ? Because as the Father sent the Son, the Son is now sending me. Why do you spend so much time going to choir practice and learning your Sunday school lesson and discipling your children? Why do you spend so much energy and effort and time doing that? It's because as the Father has sent the Son, the Son is now sending me. Why didn't you tell that girl off at the dry cleaners? Why don't you leave him? Why don't you give them a piece of your mind? It's because I have a divine mandate that as the Father has sent the Son, the Son is now sending me. And the Father did not send the Son into the world to bless everybody out that didn't give them great service at a restaurant. What is going on in your life, in my life, or not going on that could only be explained by this answer? I'm just doing the same thing the Father sent the Son into the world to do. This meaningful life is based on a scriptural mandate. Notice in verse 22, the supernatural means. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. This is a mysterious little footnote. (laughs) Jesus said, I'm sending you into the world in the same way the Father has sent me. And by the way, guys... Receive the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine when Jesus just said, As the Father has sent the Son, I'm now sending you. Lord, we're, we're tax collectors and fishermen. Lord, we're common garden variety, plain vanilla. Lord, how in the world would we ever be able to do that? And Jesus says, you will need and you now will have the power of the Holy Spirit. One of the biggest challenges in the modern church is evident at times in my life. I believe it's probably true in your life as well. In the modern church, we've learned how to do church without the power of God. Far too many of us have learned to talk the talk, look the look, and even from an external perspective, walk the walk to a large degree. But if we're not careful, we can do it all on Baptist autopilot without the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And to prove this, I'll ask you another question. What is going on in your life in terms of your service to Christ that could only be explained by somebody saying, He must have the hand of God on his life. She is obviously filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. There's no explanation for how God is using that man, blessing that teenager, blessing that church. Other than this, they must have been walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. We would do well to pray the prayer of the old hymn writer, Lord, send the old time power, thy Pentecostal power. See, as you seek to live this meaningful life empowered by the resurrection, God may drop something on your plate and cause your flesh to say, I can't do that. I I can't give that much. I can't serve that much. I I I can't do that, Lord. I can't go talk to them about Jesus. I I just can't do that. You can if God has told you to do it. Because the power to obey is included in the commandment itself. That's better preaching than what some of you are amening. The power to obey is included within the commandment itself. When God said to the darkness of the cosmos, let there be light, the power for the light to come on was included in the word of God. You can do anything that God has called you to do by supernatural means. We see the scriptural mandate and then lastly, I want you to consider with me the spiritual measure. Verse 23 is one of the most difficult verses in all of John's gospel. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Now what exactly does this mean? Well, there are many schools of thought, but let me just highlight one thing that it does not mean. Jesus is not installing an apostolic band of brothers who them and their successors will be able to robe themselves in the clothes of the clergy and announce to you whether or not they have decided to forgive you of your sins or not. That is not what this verse is teaching. This verse must be understood in the context of the Great Commission from verse 21. Namely, that when we go into the world and tell people the gospel and they repent, they are forgiven. All of this is in the context of a life that is meaningful because of the resurrection. I want you to imagine for just a moment that I've been over in Waycross. I live here in Blackshear. But imagine I'm over in Waycross and I lock my key inside my truck. Rather than paying the $60 for a locksmith, I call my wife. Hey, could you look in the hat box and bring me the extra key to my truck? I'm here at such and such a store in Waycross. And so 20, 25 minutes later, she pulls up with a nice big cup of my favorite Eliano's Cafe Mocha coffee. There's a kiss. There's a hug. And I say, I'm so sorry to interrupt your afternoon. I know it was inconvenient for you to have to come. And she says, nothing's ever too inconvenient to serve you. By the way, that's what loving couples say to each other. You say, but it's not true. Well, then lie. (laughs) If you're visiting today, that part about lying is humor. And I say, but thank you for for bringing that. Uh, uh, Where's the key? She says, the key? Then bring a key. Do you understand I appreciate the coffee, I appreciate the hug, the kiss, and the kind words, but the purpose of that trip was not fulfilled. What I fear is that for many of God's people, we're going to get to the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for our life, and we're going to say, Lord, here's my portfolio. Did pretty good, didn't I? Lord, there's my checking account. I bet you don't have many people who die when they're 57 have that much money. Lord, here's my resume. You see, that? that's an earned doctorate from an accredited school. Amen. 
Lord, I brought a picture of the bass that I snagged. That's a big one, isn't it? Lord, here's a picture on my phone of the 10-point buck that I dropped. I was after him for a long time. That's pretty good, isn't it, Lord? Lord, here's the trophy, here's the plaque, here's the gold watch, and God will look and say, where's the key? I'm grateful for all of those things, but where are the souls? Where's the work done for the kingdom? Where's the only stuff that's going to matter when it's measured against the standard of God? I want you to sit still and listen very carefully. Don't move, don't get up, don't move around. Listen. One day, all Christians will experience the power of the resurrection. If you are dead in Christ at the time of the Lord's return, the Bible says you're, you're going to be brought up from the ground. We don't have time to teach on that this morning, but you, you will experience the power of the resurrection. And even those that are alive at the return of Christ, because of the power of the resurrection, the Bible says we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and will be called up together with the Lord, be with Him and our loved ones forever and forever. Every Christian will one day experience the power of the resurrection. But can I just tell you what God is reshaping and reprioritizing in my life? I don't want to wait until that day to experience the power of the resurrection. I want my life in Jesus to be full, grateful, peaceful, meaning full. Father in heaven, Thank you for our time in your word and for the way that I believe you have spoken to our hearts this day. May we in this moment truly come to know Christ, the fellowship of his suffering and the power of his resurrection for our good and the glory of Jesus in whose name I pray. Amen. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit the broadcast ministry of Pastor Mike Stone, Senior Pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Blackshear, Georgia. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, Pastor Mike is committed to walking you verse by verse through books of the Bible. We pray this message has been an encouragement to you as you seek to learn and live the Word of God. Free audio downloads of this message, as well as general contact information, are available through our website at ebchurch.net. Thanks for joining us for today's message from the Emanuel Pulpit.